Um, from time to time, you might hear about different athletes and how different athletes have all these different superstitions. Some are pretty basic. You know, a lot of them will talk about that they will wear the same T-shirt or some other piece of clothing as long as they're on a winning streak. You know, they don't want to change anything. You know, a lot of people have the same ritual before every game. It's really common. Some people will, you know, literally every game of their career, they'll eat the same thing. They always eat chicken or they always eat peanut butter and jelly. And um, some of them are maybe a little more unusual. Uh, Les Miles, who's a coach, uh, college football coach, one of his superstitions is before every game, he'll go out onto the field and he'll pick grass and eat it. And, and he believes that this is necessary for him, as he says, to help him know that he's part of the game. And uh, that's part of his tradition. And, and they'll even show him, if you ever watch, they'll show him go out and do this because that's part of his tradition. Uh, many players will wear the same thing all the time, but maybe it gets a little more strange when they wear the same thing and don't wash it. And, and uh, for example, former league major league pitcher Steve Klein would wear the same hat all season and not wash it. And uh, that was bad in the, for a month, but for six months, I mean, it got pretty bad at the end of the... It, I, I think maybe the worst, though, is tennis star Serena Williams will wear the same pair of socks throughout an entire tournament without washing them. It's a, it could be 162 games. You know, pretty hot, sweaty stuff. And, 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 you know, you look at that and you say, some of these really sound strange. But we hear that, and, and oftentimes we understand that they're, you know, they could be maybe one of the ways that an athlete gets mentally focused on the game and, and they helps them, you know, have the right mindset. But sometimes you hear a superstition that isn't just a superstition, but it's, it's a belief. It's a belief maybe about harnessing some kind of spiritual force to help them accomplish their goal. A good example of that came out just about a week ago. Uh, right after the Super Bowl, Super Bowl winning quarterback Tom Brady was asked after the Super Bowl about superstitions, if there was anything that he relied on through the Super Bowl to help him win. And, and his answer basically was that he gave credit to his wife saying that she was a good witch who had rituals to help him win the game. Let me read some of what he said. She said, she always makes me a, a little altar for me at the, at the game. She puts together a little altar that I could bring with pictures of my kids she says, and then I have these special little stones and healing stones and protection stones that she has me wear as a necklace. He says she has him take drops that she makes, and, and she, he says a little mantra. And he, says, he said, I stopped questioning her a long time ago because it works. Uh, after the game, she told him, she said, she said, she came to me, she said, you see, I did a lot of work. You do your work, I do mine. And she continued, you're lucky that you married a witch, but I'm a good witch. Now, we may hear that, and it's not necessarily just the claim that she's a good witch that might be shocking, but it's a kind of thinking that is actually not that uncommon. You know, we, people may not call it witchcraft or, the, or this or that, but what you see is that you see it's a, it's a concept of spirituality. You know, a lot of people have done studies, and they talk about how America has become a less and less religious culture. And meaning that, you know, that we're less and less connected to traditional religions. But in the context of becoming less religious, at the same time, we've probably become more spiritual. Meaning as people walk away from religion, they still believe there's some spiritual truth. And now they try to find spirituality apart from religion. And so they're organi rejecting organized religion, but at the same time, they're still trying to find spiritual power outside of that religion. And now, this isn't anything new. In fact, you see it throughout the Bible. We're going to see it in the passage that we're looking at here today. In fact, we're going to see that for some people, they see spirituality not as a contrast with religion, but a lot of times people even try to blend those ideas and, uh, and oftentimes coming up with some really dangerous lies. But let's dive into the passage. We're going to see this in a few minutes. We're looking again at John chapter 5, and what we're going to see is that the whole passage really turns on, on a question, and a question that Jesus asks the man, and that he's really, I think, not only asking the man, but that he's really asking all of us, and that's this question, do you want to be healed? Now, we're going to see that, again, this isn't just for him. I think it's really applied to all of us. Start, start in John chapter 5, verse 1. After, uh, there, after there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda which has five roof colonnades. In these laid a multitude of invalids, the blind, lame, paralyzed. 
And so here's the scene. So Jesus goes to Jerusalem. He goes to this pool. And, and it's a pool that many people believed had healing powers. Now, in describing the pool, I want to point out something that you may not have noticed in the first reading of the passage. And, and if you have your Bible there, I'm going to encourage you to go look and see what it says in verse 4. Now, the only people that are finding verse 4 are people that have King James versions of the Bible. Everyone else sits there and says, there is no verse 4. You're, Where did verse 4 go? What you find instead, you might find a little footnote. And for those of us who have, have bad eyes, you can't read the footnote, so let me put it up there since it's too small to see. The footnote says this in the ESV. It says, uh, some manuscripts insert wholly or in part Waiting for the moving of water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain times into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in, uh, uh, stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Now, right away, you might be looking and saying, where, what is that? And where does that come from? And, and how come, you know, that's in you know, some versions and it was in the King James and it's not in most of our newer English Bibles? And, well, to try to explain that, I need, feel like I need to take a moment to um, get a, maybe a little more academic and talk a, lot, a little bit about in our English Bibles and how they're put together. And I think this is important because if you don't understand this, you might look at a passage like this and think that, well, the Bible's not reliable. Well, it shows that people disagree about what should or shouldn't be in the Bible. And, and that would be a wrong conclusion. You see, over the years, I've talked to numerous people who argue that. They argue that the Bible has been translated many times over many centuries in different languages, and, and because it's been copied and translated, it's become unreliable. It's like the game of telephone, you know, that it's been passed down. And the more that you pass on that message, the more it becomes muddled. And, and so now we're 2,000 years away from when the Bible was written, so it's, it's muddled. But what you've got to realize is that most of the people who argue that are people that are, are, are looking for an excuse to reject the Bible's authority. And they're arguing out of in ignorance. They don't understand how the Bible was translated, how we have the Bible that we hold. You see, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. And when we do translations, we're not doing from one to another to another. Modern translations are directly from those Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. And over the years, scholars have looked and they have found over 5,000 ancient manuscripts of the Greek and Hebrew, some dated all the way back to within a couple hundred years of when the originals were written. And, and what happened is, in this case, when the King James was translated, it was translated around 1600 AD, and they hadn't tried to find these old manuscripts, and it was translated based on manuscripts that were dated from about 1200 AD. Um, now, what happened is that since then, scholars have gone and found all, you know, thousands of ancient manuscripts, some whole books, some fragments, again, some the earliest dating all the way back to around 200 or maybe even before 200 AD. And what we found is in the oldest and most reliable manuscripts, in this case, this one verse wasn't in there. Uh, and, and again, it's, it, there's a couple places in this, but it's pretty rare. And there's a couple really important takeaways here. Number one is that the Bible is directly translated from the original. It's not, it's not telephone. It's a single translation. And, and not only that, but when we make this translation, it's not based on these copies that are thousands, you know, been copied many times. We go back to the oldest and, and most ancient manuscripts. And not only that, but what you've got to realize is that when you had, let's say, the King James, it was based on manuscripts from about 1,200, and then we go to our current ones, which are based on manuscripts from three to 400, 200, what we find is that there are very few changes over that 800 plus years. And, and the, the verses that were put in or added or the little changes are, are very small and none of them are significant doctrinal issues. And so what we're able to find is when you see something like this, it doesn't tell you that the Bible is unreliable, it actually shows how reliable it is. And how much confidence we should have in our English Bible. And it will even tell us in the few places where there is a difference. And again, you see that it's not a big doctrinal issue. So then you say, okay, what happened? What happened in a case like this? What most scholars believe is that somewhere along the line, somebody wrote a note that was intended to be a footnote to explain some of the historical environment of this passage. And then as somebody else came and a scribe came and made a new copy of the document, Instead of keeping it as a footnote, they put it in as a verse. 
and then it was copied after that. So, so, so what it's doing is it's giving a context. And we read in verse 7 about this guy, you know, getting up, and I try to get in the pool, and people can't get, and it's explaining that. So, so again, let's look at what the, what the uh, footnote is. It's, it's for, you know, the people were waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water, and whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease um, he had. Now, what I want you to realize is this is not in the Bible. The Bible is not teaching that God would send an angel down from heaven periodically to stir this waters, and when he did, the first one in was healed. That's not what it's teaching. What it's telling us is someone wrote this in because this was what they believed was happening. This is why people went to the pool. It's giving us some history of that. But it's, it's not what actually was happening. Actually, what we understand now is we actually know where this pool of Bethesda was, and we understand that what happened is that there were pools in Jerusalem that were fed by underground artesian wells. And what it meant is that from time to time, these artesian wells would build up pressure and release water into the pool, and what would happen from the outside, you would see suddenly these waters would move and there was no wind, and they didn't understand that it was because it was being fed by these underground wells. And so these people being set up topside thought, well, it's a miracle. And out of that misunderstanding, there was a, a superstitious belief that developed that it must be God was sending an angel to this pool and stirring it up, and then if you get in there first, then you're healed. And, and you know, some people might have gone in there and, and maybe, again, because of the power of, 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 of what belief was, is maybe they were healed, or partially healed, or they believed they were. But there were all kinds of people who believed this superstition and as a result, there were all kinds of people that were lying around this pool hoping that they would be the first one in when the water stirred. Now, that's the account when we pick up in verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So this guy's been an invalid pretty much his whole life. He's desperate for healing. He's sitting there amongst all these people hoping to get in. Now, if you think about what happens, this, the people that need to be healed the most are never the one, first one into the pool. You know, the people that are first one in the pool are the people that aren't that badly and that aren't that sick. And so the people like this that are just desperate, they're longing to be healed, and, he, and he's trying anything, even the superstition. Now Jesus enters the scene, and he goes up to, doesn't speak to everyone, he goes to one man who's there out of this huge group. In verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there, and he, he knew that he had already been there a long time, and he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now here's why I want to just stop and and Think of this experientially, all right? Here you've got this, this whole group of people. You've got this man who's been in it for 38 years. Jesus knows that this guy's been there for months, if not years. And Jesus walks up to him and says, do you want to be healed? Now, if you think about that, that question is insensitive at best, and it's insulting at worst. Of course the man wants to be healed. That's why he's at the pool, He's desperate. Why would Jesus even ask this question? See, again, it's one of the ideas that we're going to talk about in these rules of interpreting the Bible, that sometimes it's the part that seems inappropriate, that seems out of place, is kind of the highlight that's trying to help us understand the whole passage. And so we're, he's, this, is, this is the key to the whole passage. And what we've got to realize is that we're saying, why does he ask the question? Well, I want you to think about it. He's not asking because he needs to know. Jesus never asks a question because he doesn't know the answer. He's God. He knows everything. He knows these things. So he isn't asking a question to gain knowledge. He's asking a question to teach. He asks questions of people so to teach them something they don't know, they aren't aware of. Let me give you a great example of that. You see this way back in the very beginning of the Bible, the very first question ever asked in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sin, and as soon as they sin, what do they do? They go and hide. Now then Jesus, or God comes, and he comes looking for Adam, and we see in Genesis 3, 9, you know, that he comes to Adam and he says, you know, uh, you know where are you? Now, why did God ask the question? Did God lose Adam? Is he peering through the trees trying to, Adam, where are you? You know, just... 
You know, you know, sometimes so those of us who are kids or grandkids, we know what it's like to lose a child. You know, and sometimes it's, you know, they're hiding, sometimes you're panicked. You know, you're in a, a public place and so, where are they? And suddenly you look for them, you're panicked. You know, sometimes you, you're thankful to find them, sometimes you kind of wish you didn't. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a story with my, with my mom when my youngest sister was really young. Um, you know, she was in a store and, uh, you know, and she's looking, you know, suddenly she turns and my sister's gone. She looks and she looks at the bathroom. She can't find him. Suddenly, you know, she's a little preschooler. She comes up and she says, Angela, where were you? She says, I went to the bathroom. I didn't see you there. She says, says, well, I went to that bathroom over there. Well, it was in a hardware store and in the front window, there was a toilet sitting there. (laughs) And a preschooler doesn't know that, you know, yeah, it's a plate glass window, but, you know, why not go there right there? (laughs) So the the salesman walks away, comes back with a mop, and says, okay, here's, you know, here it is. And, you know, sometimes you're not sure you want to find your child. But that's not what happened here. It's not like God saying, Adam, what are you doing? Like, Adam, where are you? And why is he saying, Adam, where are you? It's not because God lost Adam. It's because Adam lost Adam. And Adam needed to be aware of how lost he was. And what you've got to realize is that that's the reason that God is always asking questions. That's the reason that Jesus asked questions. He's coming to the man and not saying, do you want to be healed? What's your answer? He's asking the man, do you really want to be healed? Do you really want the healing that I offer? Because I'm offering a healing, but do you really want what I offer? You see, there's deeper questions behind that question. Again, not only for this man, but for us. There are deeper questions that shape his answer, that shape our answer as well. You see, what we've got to realize is that, yes, Jesus comes to heal, and there's so much in the Bible about his healing ministry, but it was never just about physical healing. He was always dealing with the physical to be able to deal with and expose the deeper spiritual issue. And so we have to ask, okay, well, what does it mean to be healthy? I want to be healed, but what does it even mean? Let me even ask a different way. Uh, How many of you know who Johnny Erickson Tata is? Here's a woman who was was paralyzed over 50 years ago and has been in a wheelchair quadriplegic that whole time. And you look at that and you say, is she healthy? And if you ever hear her story, she's going to say, well, it was that paralysis that actually helped her to find health. And does she wish she could walk? And does she wish she could be physically healed? Yes. But what she realizes is that she is a healthier, happier person because of the paralysis. Because she found a deeper healing that was something that was transcendent even, even over the physical limitations of her paralysis. On the other hand, I've talked to many people over the years who seemingly have everything going for them in life that they are healthy, that they are prosperous, that they're succeeding in their business, and yet their life is a mess. And meanwhile, I've talked to other people that, that like Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata, maybe it's physical or maybe it's financial, or there's crises in their life, but yet they're healthy, happy people. What I even find is that a lot of times as I deal with people in counseling, they'll come to me and here's this crisis, and this crisis happened, and, and what I've got to help them realize is that a lot of times... The real problem isn't the crisis. You know, your life has been heading down this path and you've been heading towards a crash and this crisis happened that helped you make make you aware of the fact that you're going down a crash. It just accelerated the process. But the fact is you've been unhealthy the whole time. This just made you aware of the lack of health. And the question is now, do you just want the Band-Aid to fix the crisis or do you want to be better? Do you want to be healed? And then we've got to ask, okay, then what is the relationship between God and healing and health? Because again, what we're going to find is that you find a lot of people that especially from a superstitious standpoint or, you know, take an approach where, where, where God is a means to an end. You know, God is something, well, how do I do? What does he want me to do? What button does he want me to push? You know, what pull does he want me to jump into? How do I do this? If, what do I need to do to, to make him fix things? And again, usually the fixing things is the external. And what we have to realize is that I believe this passage is teaching a principle that I've seen played out so many times in my ministry is that many times God will allow us to face various physical or relational or emotional or financial problems because they will drive us to God. They will drive us in despair for his help. 
And, and yes, God is concerned about those things. We come to him with those problems and he is concerned, but he's even more concerned with the deeper issues in our life. The deeper issues that we're able to hide in the good times, but that hopefully are exposed in the times of crisis. And when we come to him, he asks, do you want to be healed? Do you want a Band-Aid on the crisis, or do you want to be healed of the real issues? You see, in one sense, everyone wants to be well. Of course I want to be healed. Of course I want you to fix things. We want to be well, but too often from God's perspective, the thing that we think that will heal us, the thing, the thing we think we really need, is actually the thing that is making us sick. And sometimes God taking away the thing that we need is the thing that helps us to find healing. Now what you see here is in this passage three different approaches to this whole question of health and healing. The first one is what we see of this man and it's the, I'm gonna call it the spiritual approach. Their spiritual approach is being taken not only by this man but everyone else who is waiting by that pool hoping to be the first one in when the water stirred. Pick it up in verse five. The man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another one steps down before me. And, and so here you have, yeah, I want to be healed and I'm doing these things. I'm, I'm, I'm at this pool. I'm, I'm hoping that this will be the magic thing that will heal me. The spiritual view of health and healing is that there are spiritual powers out there that we need to understand. And if we understand them and then we tap into that right spiritual power, if we do the right things, then they're going to work for our benefit. You see, to those who believe, it's understanding the spiritual powers. To those who don't believe, it looks like superstition. It looks like just some you know, things that you're going through. And so that's when you look at it. In the beginning, we talked about Tom Brady and his wife. And it sounds like superstition to those who don't believe. But, but she believes that there's spiritual powers. And these are the right things. The little altars and the manta you know, are saying the right words. And you know, these are the right things to tap into the spiritual powers. Now, in these, the goal, the primary goal is physical health and blessing. And so when you think about people that take this approach, what it is, is it's, okay, these are the primary goals. I want to be healed. I want to win the Super Bowl. I want to be able to, you know, fix my marriage. I want to do whatever. And ultimate health and blessings are physical in nature. And what we're trying to do is then tap into the spiritual powers, and those spiritual powers, whether we call it God or we call it something else, those spiritual powers are a means to the greater end. Because the greatest end is the physical blessings. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I tap into that? And, and then how do we know if it's true? How do we find out those spiritual powers? How do we find out the things that, what you hear is, well, does it work? Which is Tom Brady said, you know, I, you know, when I don't do this, I lose. When I do this, I win. You know, I do it because it works. You have all kinds of spiritual healers and people go to. Why? Because they hear stories of somebody being healed. Well, if it works, well, I'm going to go try it because it might work. And so what we need to do is that we need to figure out the right spiritual power and we need to figure out the right behavior because if we do the right behavior, the right performance, then we're going to somehow manipulate that spiritual power to work in our favor. Now, as we said, this is not only something that as you look at a you know, Tom Brady and a good witch... But the dangerous part of this is that a lot of times you have people who take biblical truth and start with biblical truth and then combine it with experience and superstition and then have a superstition that sounds biblical but it's not. And that's exactly what's happening here. That's what's here. This man comes and he says, well, and God says an angel. And the angel stirs the waters. And so it sounds biblical. It sounds like, you know, it's faith in God, but... It's not. What is it faith in? It's faith in superstition. It's faith in his performance. You look at that and you say, okay, what is it? You know, Jesus said, okay, you know, do you want to be healed? And his response is what? He says, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water stirred up. And while I'm, I'm going, another steps down before me. And he's basically saying, yes, I want to be well, but I can't do it. I can't accomplish it. It's all based on, okay, I've got to figure it out, but then I have to perform. And if I perform well enough, well, then I'm going to be healed. And according to this police system, why hasn't he been healed? Because he's not the best performer. 
And, and I hear this all the time where people even take biblical ideas and they, well, I went to this healer and, and I prayed and why did you heal? I don't have enough faith. I need to have enough faith. If I have enough faith, if I do this, if I perform, if I somehow prove myself, well, then I'll be healed. And my friends, what we've got to realize is that, no, that's, that's taking superstition and spiritual, spirituality and it's combining it with some biblical truth to come up with some really, really wrong ideas about God and how God wants us to work. The second view is, is, is what we see in the religious leaders and how they respond to this whole thing. And it's the religious approach to healing and health. Look at verse 9. At the end of verse 9, it says that he healed them, but then this day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath and it's not awful for you to take up your bed. Now here's what I want you to realize. This is an amazing response. Here you have a man who's been an invalid for 38 years. He's been on his bed for 38 years and suddenly Jesus comes and he speaks to him and the man gets up and he walks and he takes up his bed and he brings it home. And when these people hear it, their first response is that they think the big thing that happened today is a guy carried his bed on the Sabbath. What they believe is in the religious perspective is God's mainly concerned about religious things. Health and healing is, is religious. That God isn't necessarily that concerned about the physical. Again, look at verse 11. When he answered them, the man who healed me, uh, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? You know, who is the guy that sent you on the wrong path? It's not who's the guy that healed you. It's not who's the guy that is, you know, that's doing the work of God. Well, who's the guy that told you to break the rules? They condemned him for taking up his bed on the Sabbath. It's, it's not that he broke the biblical rule. The, yeah, the Bible says don't keep the Sabbath. But they had made all these man-made rules to say, well, here's what it means. That if you carry a little bed mat, a bed roll, well, you broke the rule. If you walk this far, you broke the rule. And their main concern is that when they heard everything that had happened, they weren't excited. They weren't, you know, the big incident wasn't that this man was healed. It wasn't that this might be a miracle of God. The big incident that happened is that somebody broke the law by carrying their, their mat on a Sabbath. At the end of the day, they thought this guy was worse off. That's what's amazing. They looked at it, and they looked at this guy and said, you started the day better off than you ended it, because at the end of the day, you carried your bed, and, and you actually have moved backwards. And what you see is this idea of, when you interpret it in the context, if the key passage is, do you want to be well? What do these people believe about what it means to be well? In their opinion, the negative and harmful effects of breaking the rule by carrying his bedroll was, was more significant than the positive effect of physical healing. See, there's a belief that, that God is primarily a judge to be appeased. See, he's not a loving father. He's a judge. And he's out there, you know, judging, okay, have you done something good? Have you done the right things? Are you keeping the rules? Are you... And, and the fact is that if you keep the rules, well, then you'll be blessed. If you break the rules, you could be healed. But clearly that isn't God's blessing. And God's going to get you one day. He's going to eventually get you because he's a judge to be appeased. He wants our performance. And not only that, so then we said, what do we need to do? Well, we need to know the right rules. We need to know them. We need to keep them. We need to perform. And that's what religion is. When you think about religion, you know, we often will talk about, you know, Christianity, biblical Christianity. Christ, Jesus was anti-religious, and he was. Because religion is all about what are the things that you have to do to earn your way towards God. How do you perform? How do you, how do you impress God? How do, you, how do you, you know, undo your sin? How do you do the righteous things that make yourself acceptable? And that's what you see that spirit here is. And Jesus is confronting that completely because he's choosing to do this on the Sabbath and he's saying, no, that I am concerned about the physical and the spiritual and no, it's not about keeping the rules. What did this guy have to do to be healed? He did nothing. He didn't have a faith. He didn't even know who Jesus was when Jesus healed. Because God offers us grace. And we see this in, in, when we look at and reflect on the health and healing offered by Jesus. Again, in verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up and take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, then he took up his bed and walked. Now, I want you to see, first of all, again, he didn't even know who this was speaking to him when this happened. Because they come to him and they say, well, who healed? I don't know. A guy walked away. I have no idea who it was. But it's also saying something about the nature of God. And that is this, that God cares. There's a sense that when we look at how God wants to heal, 
It's not just spiritual. The fact is, physical health and blessings are important, but they're ancillary. They're significant. God's concerned about healing the whole of our being. But what, when we say it, they're ancillary, they're not just secondary, but they're also de- related. They, they come from, they flow from, they're connected. And so when you've got to understand it, saying, I want to heal, but it, ultimately, if you're healed physically, but you're not healed spiritually, the physical is going to fall apart. The relational, the, you know, the, the, the emotional, the physical, all those things are going to eventually fall apart. If you're here spiritually, it's going to help heal everything else. But the physical is important. God is concerned about that. Look in verse 14. Here's the key to understanding this. After he's healed, they call him in. The religious people, they give him a hard time about carrying his mat. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, again, if we read this by itself, you read it out of context, you might come to wrong conclusions. He's not saying, well, if you sin, you're going to get sick again. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is, is that he's, he's, this guy had been looking for healing at the pool. He's found physical healing, and now Jesus approaches him where? At the temple. At the temple, in the context of the temple, in the context of spiritual things. And when he says, sin so that nothing worse happens to you, he's not talking about his sickness returning. What he's saying is that sin no more, get right with God. Because you recognize that it's only if you get right with God that something worse won't happen to you. And what is the worst that he's talking about? It's the spiritual. See, the principle that is that God often allows us to face very obvious physical, relational, financial problems to get our attention. But all these, again, are secondary. He's trying to get our attention to drive us to a deeper need. And what is the something worse that he's talking about here? You know, the worst is that you can have the whole world and you lose your soul. The worst, and I've seen people that have this, that have every blessing. And because they have every blessing, they continue to put their faith in the promises of the world. And because they put their faith in the promises of the world, they never find Christ. And a lot of times, the greatest blessing, and many of us will share this story. Many of us will say, my life turned around when I faced this crisis. When I faced this, you know, this crisis, it was bigger than I am. That's what broke me. That's what started to get me to realize that that I couldn't do it on my own. It's the warning that Jesus warned against in Luke chapter 18 when he talked about this. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle for than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because when we have all things, when we have all these blessings, we think we can do it on our own. We think we can buy happiness. We're never driven to a point of brokenness and dependence. And he's saying, sin no more, because right now you're in a dangerous place. You're healthy physically. Now, I don't think that means that you're healthy spiritually. Because you know what? You could be in a worse place if you walk away from God with this, and suddenly you have health, and and you are less dependent on God. You're going to be in a worse place at the end of the day. But it also teaches us something about the nature of God, and that is that God is a God of compassion and grace. Now, again, think about what those people at the pool believed about God. You know, they believed that God had the power to heal, and he put it out there at this prize for people to belong to. But, you know, but the first one in, you know, heals the water. I'm mean, going to tell you, if, if, if we had a contest, hey, let's get a bunch of handicapped people, and I have a, I have a cure for them, and we're going to ring a bell, and the first one to come and get the cure, well, we're going to give you the prize, and everyone else, we're going to just say, too bad. You know, you say, you're a monster. But that's what these people believed about God. That God was, had this test, and... God didn't really care. And the other people, you know, God doesn't care about you physically. And, but God is a God of compassion. And what we've got to realize is that he cares about your need. And if you're here today and you're struggling and you're physically ill, if, you're, if your marriage is at the edge, if you're emotionally at your edge, if you're broken, God cares about those things. This isn't a place where we just talk about spiritual, you know, theoretical ideas and you know, good luck in real life. No, this is a place where we talk about spiritual truth that defines real life and God cares and God heals. But it's not something that we have to earn. We're all spiritually invalids and God doesn't call us to pull and say, okay, well, here's what you have to do. You know, first one in, here, or you have to keep the rules. No, it's a God of grace and he offers us grace. But it's understanding in that grace that we have to realize that a right relationship with God is our greatest need. 
that he wants to heal us, but the greatest need is, 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 is all those other things, they make us aware of the need. The physical problems can make us aware that that invalid was there because he was aware of a need. But the deepest need we have is one that we cannot fix. The physical will try to fix. The deepest need is one we cannot fix. And God allows us to face those other needs to try to get us to the point where we look to him and look for his solution. But they're always symptoms of a deeper need. You know, the question is, we just want, do we want to be healed? Do you just want the Band-Aid to fix the symptom, or do you want the physician to come in and fix the real issue? And if we do, then all other health and blessings will flow from this relationship. That doesn't mean they're going to be physically healed. Does it mean that everything's going to, no, but it means that all other health and the ability to be able to find health and prosper in any circumstance flow from a right relationship with God. And wrap up quickly. Let me give you a couple verses that I think make this point beautifully. Colossians chapter 1. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, whether visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, in him all things hold together. He is basically saying we were created for God. We were created for a relationship with God. We have this God-shaped vacuum at the core of our being. And it's only if we have that relationship with God will life work. That's what we were created for. And other things will bring short-term satisfaction, but they won't make life work. In a sense, you know, I, I can use the illustration that, you know, my car runs on gasoline. It's designed for that. I could put other liquid substances into that, but it's not going to run my car. I could be sincere. It's not going to run my car. It's designed to have gas in the engine. I'm designed for a relationship with God. And other things might bring short-term, seeming like they're going to work, but at the end of the day, everything else is going to fall apart. It's the spiritual DNA into my soul. And if I understand that and have a right relationship with God, look what it says happens. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. You know what it's saying here? Is that if I have a right relationship with God, that he begins to reconcile everything, every aspect of my life. So suddenly every part of who I am I understand it differently. I understand my finances differently. I understand my marriage differently. I understand understand my wounds differently. I understand anger differently. I understand everything. And suddenly it starts to bring healing to every aspect. But the question that we have to ask is the question that Jesus asked. Is, do you really want to be healed? Do you really want to be healed? Do you want the healing that he offers? Because the fact of the matter is, as we read this passage, and it's not just speech, Jesus speaking these words to this man at the pool. It's speaking to each one of us. Do we want to be healed? Are we willing to accept his healing? Or do we want to keep going back to our superstition and doing it our way? And do we want the band-aid over the problem? Or or do we really want to give him the right to dig deep into our soul and heal us at the deepest of levels? You see, Jesus is here today, I believe, spiritually. And in his, these are his words. And they're not only his words that he spoke then, they're his words that he continues to speak. And I really believe that he speaks to each one of us here today. And he says, do you want to be healed? And he invites us to accept that invitation. Do you want to be healed? Do you want that relationship with him? Do you want to understand that healing that's, that won't just fix the band-aid, but that will deal with the deepest levels of your soul? No matter who you are here today, no matter, you know, if you haven't thought about God for, for decades, whether you've wandered away, whether you just need, know you need something to be, be restored, he gives you that invitation today. Will you respond to it? Thanks for joining us. If you have any questions about what we talked about, Jesus Christ, our church, or anything else, connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or by email. We'd love to hear from you.